Well, the stay-at-home stock darlings are feeling the heat now, testing the strategy and resolve of their leaders. And today, John Fort brings us up close with the CEO of a tech company that's continuing to expand its services portfolio, even though sentiment has turned negative. This is a company I patronize, or maybe I should put it this way, my son patronizes. <laughs> Many of us do, Ty. Yes, Tony Shu is co-founder and CEO of DoorDash, a company now trading below its 2020 IPO price, down more than 70% from its November highs. I first met Tony four years ago, and DoorDash was just another hot startup in a surging gig economy. And even back then, he struck me as having an unusually methodical, pragmatic approach to his role in the enterprise, uh, sorry, restaurant ecosystem. And that's partly because he told me he and his parents worked for a time in other people's restaurants. I was born to classic immigrants, um, and you know, my family moved to this country with $300 or, or less in our bank account. My dad was getting his PhD at the University of Illinois and working full-time as a waiter. And my mom, to support the family, worked multiple jobs. But she was really working multiple jobs, one of which, which was in a restaurant, um, so that she could save up enough money to uh, afford the medical education to get back her license because she had effectively lost her license moving from China where she was a doctor in Eastern medicine. But when she immigrated to the U.S., and that license was no longer recognized. And so she was saving up money in the various jobs, both to you know, put food on the table and support the family, but also to never give up on her dream. Tony's taking the long view on today's market, too. I had a working lunch with him just last week in Manhattan, sit down, not delivery. And he talked about the ways DoorDash is trying to help delivery drivers cope with high gas prices and help young employees deal with gut uh, gut-wrenching market and help restaurants innovate with the flexibility that technology brings. He shared similar ideas this month on CNBC after earnings. During the pandemic, we saw restaurants get very inventive and creative, selling different types of food um, from the same kitchen. You know, a Chinese restaurant selling now Mexican food and, and, and many versions of, the, of this. In fact, we've seen, you know, tens of thousands of these types of opportunities, these virtual brands and stores rise on the platform literally from zero just a couple of years ago. Um, we also saw new innovation, you know, where restaurants are now shipping um, some of their foods, whether it's, you know, frozen foods from places like Lou Manati's and their great delicious deep dish pizza in Chicago, um, you know, to Carlos Bakery, um, you know, and, and their amazingly delicious cookies. I mean, to other restaurants who are now recognizing they're not just um, a place that sells food, but a place that sells merchandise. So with labor costs high, consumer budgets tight, as we saw today in Walmart's earnings, a lot of restaurant customers could use the extra sales. And now that the hype has faded from a lot of pandemic names, we'll see whether Tony can effectively roll up his sleeves and pull away from competitors in local commerce and logistics. I, I think it's not so much about delivery as it is about marketing and some things like ghost kitchens that are going to determine whether this model works longer term. But my question really is how much he thinks that consumers are going to want to keep spending at the same levels they were before inflation was so high and whether he thinks that when it comes to ordering takeout, that might be the first thing to go. Well, a big part of what he's doing is share of wallets. See, it's not just about restaurants. It's also convenience stores. So getting something from Walgreens, getting medicines, for example. Now they got this thing called Double Dash, where you put in your order, and then do you want, not fries with that, but do you want ice cream with that? They map out the route using data so that the driver can also pick up something else for you. So if those things catch on, and it's not just about ordering out, but it's also about convenience stores, it's also about groceries, there you go. So, so it can be pickup, not just, it's not just delivery from restaurants anymore. If I need some Aleve cream to put on my aching Achilles, <laughs> I can call them and, and do it. What, what are their arrangements with restaurants? Do they, do they sign up restaurants to use their service or what? They do. They do. And part of what they've done during the pandemic is roll out a new pricing structure where it's not just here's how much it is, you've got to have us deliver it. Now you can order something on DoorDash and pick it up yourself. Right. Ah. And so it, it's good for the restaurant. It's good for you if you want to pay a little bit less. And, you know, their argument in part is that the interface is convenient enough for the people who subscribe and use DoorDash a lot. They'd rather use an interface they know than go to each individual restaurant. If those plays work out, then DoorDash could end up being a different kind of model than a lot of investors might have expected. And ultimately about consumer loyalty to that interface and that system. They already have your credit card saved. So that makes it easier. John, thanks so much.